So what are the clinical applications of uh, psychedelics? Why are they used and what do they achieve, Dave? That's a great question. Um, there are different, as I said before, there's, there's different tools for different, different, uh, different contexts and for different people. Um, I guess one that I'd like to talk about that I guess would be probably more suitable for more people, plus it just became legalized in Australia so I can talk about it a bit more freely, uh, is MDMA-assisted therapy. Um, and this would be a very different therapeutic uh, option as opposed to something like ayahuasca, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, DMT, for example, as this would be more of a, a healing modality that would be more gentle and it would be assisted by a therapist. So this isn't the idea of just going out and taking a bunch of MDMA and partying and call it, calling it therapy. Um, this is basically going into a situation where you're with a trained practitioner um, who can guide you through a therapy session while you are under the influence of a therapeutic dose of MDMA. And then the question is, well, why, why would this be therapeutic? What would be the point of this? And the idea, I think, when you look at it from a more top-down approach is going that you're allowing someone to, or you're encouraging someone to look within in terms of what their traumas are or what their maybe negative behaviors are or uh, maladaptive coping mechanisms are. And you're allowing them to approach that and see that from a place of self-love, not judgment. And I think that if, if people are able to do that in terms of reflect on what they've been through or where they are now in terms of not being where they want to be, I think if you can approach that and interact with that from a place of self-love, not a place of judgment, you're more likely to have a more encouraging and more healing and more supportive interaction with yourself in that context. And I think that this is where something like looking at talk therapy, for example, is that a lot of men don't respond well to talk therapy. Um, much fewer men respond well to talk therapy than females. We just don't. And I think that the advantage of looking at psychedelics from a clinical practice is that you're now applying experiential therapy. So different medicines will be more suitable for different things. Um, and But I think that for a lot of people who are approaching psychedelics, it can be based around healing or integrating traumas. And I think that doing something like this or looking at something like this, again, I'm not telling anyone to go out and take psychedelics and do this, but if this is a path that you feel guided to, doing this is advantageous because you're also going to be guaranteed to be in the, in the safety and under the care of a practitioner, which I think is very important. When it comes to all psychedelics, it's like a like a Spider-Man, like great power, great responsibility thing, um, high risk, high reward. And I think the most important thing is to be doing it in a supervised and controlled fashion. Mm -hmm. Rudy? Well said. Uh, well, one thing, like you said, the first thing we want to say is, is this really, we, we're not advocating for people to go in, and do something that's not illegal. In Australia right now, MDMA, and psilocybin have been approved to be used with um, psychotherapy assisted, um, so top therapy with with the, the the psychedelics. In the U.S. so far, it's only ketamine that's been FDA approved to be used for treatment resistant depression, PTSD, and other causes. The, uh, the MDMA and psilocybin are very close to the FDA approved in the U.S., so we're just monitoring it for now. And, and second, uh, for me, you know. The, the, Dave, we've talked about this. You know, we're geeks, we're neuroscientists, we, we like to understand. And what made me understand this really quick is when you talk about those neurons, that, that, that set of neurons called the default mode network. The, de the default mode network, it is the part of the brain. It's not an anatomical part of the brain, but it's a set of neurons that fire together and really make the story of who we are. It's almost our ego. You know, like everything you've heard, the story of who you are, your limitations, uh, most of your thoughts go from that default mode network. So we wake up in the morning and automatically our, our, our mind goes into the same thing. So what psychedelics have been shown to do, and they've done functional MRIs to show that, that they can disrupt the default mode network. So for me, my brain, the way I understood it, it's almost like there's a short circuit and then you come and you in interrupt that short circuit. And now the brain plasticity, you can have connections of different parts of the brain that now opens you up to a completely new way of thinking. That's how you can reframe different parts of your, the story you've said about yourself, what has happened to you. Now you can reframe them from a different position. Most people, after they do a, a psychedelic experience, no matter what the culture, there's a lot of common themes that always come back. 
the number one thing, it's always clarity. Uh, every time I do ketamine with my patients, that's the first thing. They're like, oh my God, it's so clear. I know what to do now. Number two is intensity. Uh, most people rate it as the one of the most important things they've done after maybe the child, uh, the birth of their, ch their children. And number three, to me, that's the most important is that oneness, that, that, that feeling that you are one with the universe. Actually, they've done study that's called the mystical experience. When you are lucky enough that you do a, a, a psychedelic experience and you experience that sensation of unity, that sensation of oneness, this is what every book, every religion is talking about. And they've done a study. People who actually have that sensation of oneness, actually that is the most healing um, um, determinant. People who have this, the antidepressant effect tends to be much more lasting. We can't explain it. It's even hard to put it into words, but when you actually experience it, it is deeply healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that was a phenomenal uh, explanation of the default mode network and uh, understanding the importance of disrupting that for creating the experience of psychedelics was something that I didn't learn until a bit later, which was when I was learning about a molecule that we, we've discussed before called BUFO. And, um, the thing that I love about what we're looking at here in terms of this disruption of the default mode network is, is what I was talking about before, with, which is experiential learning. And I think I think I, I used this analogy when we had a chat the other day where I said that if you if you walk out and get hit by a bus, you're going to learn a lot of things from that experience. Now, you're going to learn to look both ways before you cross the street and that getting hit by a bus hurts. But the most important things that you're going to learn from having a near death experience is the fragility of human life, the importance of you know telling the people that you care that you love them. Um, the importance of, you know, slowing down, taking time, leaving, like all the things that you would learn from that, you didn't necessarily learn from the impact at high velocity, you learned from the experience that you went through. And I think that's the amazing thing about what you're talking about here with, well, what's the point of disrupting the default mode network if it's just going to kick back on when the, when the psychedelic is over? And it's that you had the experience of disrupting it. And I think that's the really powerful thing when we talk about this idea of intention with psychedelics is going, okay, we're going to take a little bit of you offline and then now you're going to be able to influence this a little bit more in terms of changing the way that you're thinking or working on a part of you that maybe you're not too happy with. And I, I like to relate humans to cars a lot. And I, I would, in this analogy, use the movie cars where the cars are, are, are alive, the characters. And I think what we're looking at here to bring it back to the TRT thing is that when we look at what Rudy was talking about before with this idea of that, you know, we are basically experiencing life through our bodies. If, if our hormones are out of whack or if we've got, you know, systemic inflammatory problems or all these different things, it's going to feel very different to be that car. And when our consciousness is inhabiting our body, we're getting this constant feedback, which is why there's a psychological symptoms from having low testosterone. So if we can fix all that up, that's great. We can fix all the car up, but we haven't made you a better driver by giving you a better car. So now when we're looking at, at looking at these psychedelic therapies, which I think you can also use mindfulness meditation to get there in a way that's a bit slower and more controlled. And I think that's something that should always tie into psychedelic use is that now we can also look at not just fixing the car, but also making you a better driver of the car. And I think one of the most important things about being a good driver is being aware of yourself and also being aware of the drivers around you. And when you have this experience of shutting down this default mode network, what kind of gets replaced with the part of you that is your consciousness is the connection to everyone and everything else. And I think that if you can have that, experience of being connected to everyone and everything else it's going to change the way that you show up it's going to change the way that you interact with the people it's going to change the importance of things like empathy um and i think that that's one of the most amazing things you can give to a man in combination with fixing his testosterone so right. so so to me and and that was the, the always the important thing because testosterone therapy thyroid therapy fixing nutrition uh, decreasing inflammation it can make you into a badass, no question. But how do you become grounded, vulnerable, compassionate, with empathy, while still being a badass and you can do all those things? This is to me, you know, life is always like this, that balance of the yin and the yang. So being able to have a little of this and little of that, too much of one is not, is not good. I, you know, I've told you that. On some of my patients, when they come to me, they've been broken by low testosterone for all this time. They identify as this new person, you fix their testosterone, and then now they turn into what I call CA, confident ales. And I'm like, that wasn't the goal of our mode optimization. We want to make you into a better man. 
now that you got this power, you got back your power, you got back your energy, do something positive with it. And the synergy of pistachio and psychedelics. And when we say psychedelics, Dave, I like that you said that. It's not the only way to get this. You can do it with meditation, with breath work. You can do it with others. I, I, I've tried. I was never able to get myself where I wanted to. For me, the use of psychedelics with combination of, uh, of hormone optimization has been really my optimum. And that's what I bring to a lot of my patients. Not all of my, not many of my patients do, do psychedelic therapy. They can do it by other ways. There are people who get that by prayers, by whatever means necessary. But it's finding that awesome masculine power and you balance it with that groundedness, that sacredness, that vulnerability. That's what makes you the best version of yourself.